Welcome, you're listening to Digging Star Wars, your online journal of the films that inspired George Lucas to create the Star Wars saga. Hello and welcome into this December issue of Digging Star Wars where we're going to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly and compare it to The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I'm very excited about this episode. I know I say that every episode, but I, I but this time I mean it <laughs> because we have with us our first repeat guest, Mr. Phil Congleton. Hey, everybody. This is awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, not only was I the first guest, but now I'm the first repeat guest. Yes. That, and I am excited. I'm ready to go. And we told him to throw that freaking script out the window, and we're going to do this unplugged, improv, get yourself dirty, let's do it. So, um, I'm, Yeah, so if I start rambling off, just smack me. <laughs> I'm very excited, and I, I, I want to say, too, is that while Phil, as he mentioned, it was the first guest, Phil has done so much for the audio blog. He's recorded a lot of our sessions. He's helped us out a great deal. He's provided research material and uh, is... I'm Chris's library. Yeah, and you're my public library. I mention that very often. I don't know if people notice this or not. I know, like, my first first season, I was kind of all over the map. I, I did the films in release order versus chronological or, you know, episode order and still trying to figure stuff out. I really enjoyed those episodes, but I was still... Even when you were on with Enter the Dragon, we were still trying to figure things out back then, mm-hmm. you know? So when I attacked this... Uh, season two, I really wanted to think about what films placed where on the calendar when we were recording them and releasing them. So, obviously, for Halloween, I wanted to do a horror film, and we did Nosferatu, and we featured music of Geocentric, and it, it felt great, you know, and and uh, I was the Mike Gleason episode, and uh, a lo- I got a lot of great feedback on that particular episode. And in the next uh, month, in November... We did Fort Apache because it was Thanksgiving, and we wanted to talk about uh, the U.S. Cavalry and the colonists and settlers and whatnot, dealing with Native Americans and, and that whole thing. So that really worked out nicely and subtle. And then – so I, I laid this out so that when we got to December – and I didn't know what film was going to be with Empire Strikes Back. Um, I, I actually made a decision relatively late in the game. But um, I wanted to do Empire in December. And that's because Empire Strikes Back, uh, and this is super geeky, but people listening know that I'm super geeky. Uh, it's one of my holiday films. It's on my holiday film rotation because as a kid, I loved Empire, and I would watch my um, VHS tape I recorded of Empire off TV uh, because of the whole Hoth thing. Like, who who doesn't like watching Hoth and then being able to go out with your sled and go sledding, playing in the snow, and I did build forts in the snow, and it, it, it's, I, I'm so glad that I woke up and scheduled Empire to fall in December. Uh, but I will say the flip side of that is as I'm watching The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly this past week, the week before Christmas, it seemed a little out of place. Yeah. <laughs> I can see the snow in Empire Strikes Back, but... You know, yeah. the good and bad and the ugly didn't have much Christmas <laughs> stuff going on. No, when you shoot a guy through a pillow in the head, uh, it's not exactly what you think about with your traditional holiday films. But um, uh, but I well, in some parts of the country, it has. I, I, I guess it. I guess it does. <laughs> um, uh, but I will say this: the good and the bad and the ugly is a film that I've always seen only parts of. So this is the first time I've seen this film from beginning to end. And uh, wow, I'm blown away by it, and I'm really excited to. Uh, I, I you know I did some reading on it, obviously for the for the for the audio blog here, but I'm really excited for you to educate us on this film, um, and, and talk about it. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this because I have to be perfectly honest with you and everyone that I didn't really see many connections to mm. this. <laughs> yeah. In fact, the the first Star Wars movie kept popping into my head watching this movie, mm-hmm. and I'm hoping to mention some of that a little bit later. But, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what you came up with. Cool. All right, well, let's get right into it. Okay, well, um, you know, normally when we, we do these things, we read the synopsis off the back of the DVD case or VHS case or whatever we have on our... But us two idiots left both of them at home. (laughs) Yes. That's what you get when when you're recording a few days before Christmas, I guess. Um, So uh, we're going to try to tell you the film without spoiling too much. As always, you know there's going to be spoilers when we talk about a movie. 
Um, but nonetheless, I think, uh, you know, we'll treat it fairly. Yeah. Um, so the and, – and Phil's going to interrupt me here because, um, again, this is my first full, you know, exposure to this film. Now, uh, I'm obviously familiar – the director – is very famous uh, spaghetti western director Sergio Leone. I'm assuming that's the American pronunciation. And if I butcher his name and anyone else's name, I apologize in advance. Yeah, I've I've always said Sergio Leone. Yeah. So. I just think you know um, I I have the you know I was lucky enough with work to be over uh, did, did some production in Italy, and if I saw this name on a card, uh, not knowing who he was, I would have pronounced his name Sergio Leone. So, yeah. um, but we'll say we'll go American and go Sergio Leone. It features. Uh, Iconic music from uh, Ennio Maricone again, maybe Maricone, but um, with the whistling and, and everything. I mean, it's just when you hear the opening theme, you instantly know you've heard this music before. And it's such an uh, I, I, I hate to I hate to already stray from our synopsis, but the opening so freaking cool. Mm-hmm. Um, like I I'm, I watched that over and over because I was just so blown away by how in, innovative and amazing it was. But uh, at any rate, it deals with three characters, uh, as you can imagine. And one's been literally is labeled the good, one's literally labeled the bad, one's labeled the ugly. Exactly. All right. Now, Clint Eastwood is the good guy. And this is a reoccurring character in this trilogy of films, The Man With No Name. Mm-hmm. And what are the other two films that uh, – this is the third installment of a trilogy. What are the other two films? Oh, why did you decide to ask me that? Uh, it's a, <laughs> I think it's a fistful of dollars and for a few dollars more. Yes. See? Look, he knew it. Okay. Um, so there you go. And uh, I don't know if the story is a continuation. I think it's a repeating character. And uh, I've only seen this one in the trilogy. So my bad. Yeah, they're, they're not really recurring characters. They're just kind of – I don't know. I don't know how you would describe it. It's like the the same cast, right? You know, or well, the same kind of group of dudes, right? Uh, or right. characters used for this kind of uh, same, you know, yeah, formula. same type of character. Yeah. So Clint Eastwood plays. Uh, he's the man with no name, but he's referred to by another character as Blondie. Mm-hmm. So I think for our sake, we'll we'll call him that. And then there is another character, the ugly one. Played by Eli Wallach. Okay, and is it Toko? Toku? Yeah, T U C O. Toku. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of like this Weasley cowboy, and he gets in and out of deals with people, and there he's definitely the comedic element to the story. I mean, Clint Eastwood has certainly some great comedic moments as mm-hmm. well, but he's he's the main you know clown. And then there is a character known as Angel Eyes. Yes. Uh, that's Lee Van Cleef. Correct. Yes. Okay. And he's just a sadistic SOB. I yeah. mean, like, holy cow. Mm-hmm. And and the, and the film opens up, you, you're introduced to these individual characters in different ways, whether it's a hold up or in the case of Angel Eyes, he's visiting people and, and trying to get information and knocking them off. And I am really paraphrasing here. But in short, you learn that there is a whole lot of money to be found somewhere. Yeah. I think it's 200,000 mm-hmm. gold whatever confederate gold and it's taking place obviously in 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 the west during the civil war Mm -hmm. and you come to learn that uh with the interactions of these different characters that it is buried in a grave Mm -hmm. in some cemetery yes and it's got some name attached to the Mm -hmm. grave and different characters know different information tuku knows the cemetery blondie clint eastwood's character Oh, is you know through the course of the film learns where the grave is buried, and Angel Eyes just wants it. Exactly. And and he Angel Eyes has the has some power because he's he's able to get into. Um, I don't he, know if, he he's part of the Union camp. Yes. Yeah. So and they go through this adventure. They go through this journey. There's constant deals being made. At one point, Tuco and Blondie have a pact, and they you know they, they mm. double, you know Tuco always double crosses because that's his nature. And what's really interesting about the film overall is that. The tagline on the one poster I saw was, for three men, the Civil War wasn't hell, it was practice. Yeah. And I thought that was really cool, because mm-hmm. when you're watching this movie, it's a, first of all, for its day and age, extremely violent. I know mm-hmm. there was a lot of um, reaction to the violence uh, in the film community at the time, like, well, yeah. this is too much. And it's brutal, and, you know, I mean, some people might say it's literally shooting fish in a barrel to, make a, to show a, a film about war being held, let alone the American Civil War. Mm-hmm. But what is so great is like a like a great Greek myth. The war is the backdrop. It certainly comes into play in the story, but it's really about this odyssey that um, Tuku and Blondie are on, and their nemesis, Angel Eyes, gets involved. 
and it takes a lot of amazing twists and turns. You really don't know how it's going. The only one that's really in the know is Blondie, and you don't know that till you know very near the conclusion. Yes. But but it, even but you question even when he even when the audience knows that Blondie knows something, the way this film is shot. The way it's written and the way it's acted, I should say directed, you don't know who to trust or what to believe. And I think that's what's so cool about it. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is the fact that it's two hours and 40 minutes long, mm -hmm. but there's a basic plot of three guys trying to find this lost treasure. Right. And But the, the way it's done and directed and put together, it's epic in size. And it's just brilliant and just wonderful to watch. And uh, it, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it really is. I Again, I was just, like I said, I was literally blown away. And I, I almost feel embarrassed I haven't seen it up until now. But uh, but I'm glad I'm glad that, you know, the blog is making me um, commit to watching these movies. Because yeah. uh, cause this, is a, this is a must see, people. Like, yes. you have to see this movie. And yes, I can... people, watch this movie. <laughs> And uh, I, I cannot wait to see uh, a fistful of dollars and a few dollars more. Yeah. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on the Spaghetti Western. Cool. Uh, the Spaghetti Western kind of came out in the 60s. It was actually used as like a critical term, making fun of movies like this. Mm. Uh, Americans were so used to those TV Westerns that when the formula changed a little bit, uh, they actually made fun of these movies. Mm. Basically, all they were were... Um, Western movies based on American history uh, that were shot in Italy or Spain mm -hmm. or somewhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that's where the term Spaghetti Western came from because the critics were making fun of them. And as time has gone on and the movies have been accepted more and like this one have reached cult status and are considered fantastic, right. the term Spaghetti Western also became an accepted positive critical thing about it mm -hmm. and that's basically where the term came from oh you know what i, th I think that's interesting because uh, i did hear that uh you know it wasn't you know that i guess there was it, it, like to your point it got a cult following I, I know watching this movie it reminded me a lot of tarantino stuff and rodriguez's mm -hmm. stuff and of course they both are pretty you know steeped in their uh yeah in, in you know in older movies and movies of this nature and it's so cool that this was being done in the 60s yeah i think that's why it had a little bit of a critical issue too because you know uh the whole foreign film market hit pretty much in the 60s mm -hmm. and people had to get used to dubbing yeah and you know there's only three guys in this movie that actually speak english everyone else is being translated and dubbed yeah so in fact i found out that um Sergio Leone didn't really speak English at all, so him and Eli Wallach had to talk to each other in French. <laughs> and then Eastwood, Eastwood and um, Van Cleef just had interpreters. Wow. So there was a lot of uh, stickiness that they had to get through in order to get this thing shot. And you know what's cool about that is that it's such a, you know, a macho, male-driven movie, and mm -hmm. these characters are so stoic. Mm -hmm. It's awesome because... Uh, so much is said uh, with just the posture and the looks that the characters give each other, not to mention the, you know, the trademark close up of the, you know, the gunslingers in battle. Like, I mean, it's been it's been it's a cliche now, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it, and replicated in everything you can possibly imagine, mm -hmm. even commercials and, and, and kids videos. Yeah. But, um, you know, this guy did it first. This guy came up with it. And it's uh, and there's no. There's no language. There's no words being spoken, but the message is being conveyed so clearly, and that's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, that was his claim to fame, that he was one of the earliest people to use the close-up in that kind of a situation. You yeah. Know? It's, 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 I mean, there, you're, you're like, you can see the pores on Eli Wallach's face in this movie. And I can't imagine, like, I'm sitting here watching it on my, you know, 17 inch modest four by three screen at home you know yeah. i'm not i'm not watching this you know in some you know huge home theater or even in the theater i can only imagine what this looked like sitting in the theater and seeing something like that it, it plastered on it. out film goers at the time they're like yeah. whoa yeah because in contrast to that you'll have a complete confederate 
Yankee battle mm-hmm. with 1,500 soldiers out there trying to cross a bridge. Mm-hmm. So the the shots are all over the place as far as, you know, the mise-en-scene, yeah. if you will. But it's just so well thought out and graphic. And that was actually something that I want to talk about later when we talk about the comparisons. That I really felt that the frame, the, the composition of the frame, it reminded me a lot of almost a graphic design approach to filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, it, you know... Um, Certainly cinematic. Uh, and Enya and Marconi's music just brings it out even more. Yeah. It's just brilliant. Yeah. All right. Well, um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I interrupted you. Let, I, I just wanted to say, uh, for those of you that are trying to find a reference on Ennio Marconi, uh, he did the music for The Untouchables, De Palma's Untouchables. Oh, I didn't know that. That was cool. Yeah. So, the, you know, the whole wah, wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, December is the birthday month of our... Theme songs composer Paul Ohlers, so we decided to honor Paul by using his music throughout this episode. So happy birthday, Paul, and uh, we hope you enjoy Paul's music. All right, so yeah, I got a few more things I can mention about the movie. I read that Eli Wallach almost got himself killed three times during the filming of this. <laughs> he uh, accidentally drank acid, which what? he thought was his soda uh, that a crewman put down next to his soda. Uh, fortunately, <laughs> they were able to clean him out, but he had sores in his mouth during the filming. Wow. Um, he almost got himself decapitated during that train scene uh, <clears throat> because they didn't realize the steps jutted out like a foot or two. So uh. if he had moved his head up, head would have been gone. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, at one point, uh, the scene where he's tied up on the horse and Eastwood shoots the rope and the horse takes off, well, the horse kept going for a mile <laughs> while wow. he was all strapped up on the horse. <laughs> so it was a tough kind of shoot. Uh, in fact, I, I read that they said that uh, Eli Wallach in his autobiography said that, uh, yeah, Sergio Leone had a tough time, like, taking care of his, his cast and crew. We, they were always kind of worried about their safety. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, it, it, I mean, I guess that happens in every Hol- Hollywood film, but, you know. Charles Bronson was originally supposed to be in the uh, uh, Lee Van Cleef role. Oh, really? I didn't know. But uh, I guess he had such a big head from The Magnificent Seven that he uh, turned it down. Interesting. So, and... Uh, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all I have for you right now. If I think it's something else along the way, I'll let you know. Cool. Well, thank you again, Phil, for uh, mm-hmm. giving all that background information. It's very cool. Mm-hmm. Let's dive into Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back and, and what the heck it has to do with the good and the bad and the ugly. So, to your point, why is this film with The Empire Strikes Back? And that is a very good question. Well, um, here here's some more vague vagueness for you, all right? Okay. Um, when I wrote down this film on my ultimate list, mm-hmm. when I was beginning to do this, mm-hmm. it was because I read an article on StarWars.com, which I can no longer find. So I don't know what happened to it, but it talked a lot about uh, the rifle that Clint Eastwood's character had in this film in comparison to Boba Fett's rifle. Like, I don't know if it was like the, the you know, the part of the rifle that butts up against the shoulder or what, but, you know, the prop designer said that he referenced this. And that's why it originally went on my list. Oh, wow. Yeah, but that article I cannot find, and I, I, and I was a little, I got a little paranoid because, like, after we committed to this, I'm like, oh, boy. Yeah. Um, but in researching other stuff, Jeremy Bullock, who is the actor that portrayed Boba Fett in the original films and makes a cameo in Episode Three, mm-hmm. he gave he's given a lot of interviews about Boba Fett, as you can imagine, since Boba Fett is such a popular character. Yeah, and he said that he got the mannerisms of Fett from the Man with No Name. Okay, and he specifically referenced the trilogy and a fistful of dollars. Mm-hmm. He didn't reference the good and the bad and the ugly. To yeah. be fair, but it's the same character. Okay, so I felt, okay, this is good, and I, I'm still a little worried. And then, uh, and 
you know, thinking about this even more, I was like, okay, um, I got to find something. Um, I did come across that Lucas, George Lucas, that is, uh, in one of the commentaries on one of the versions of Empire Strikes Back, I believe, you know, must have been, I guess, you know, the special edition DVDs. Yeah. And, you know, but he mentioned that he always thought of and, you know, when he was thinking of Boba Fett and, and involved in the creation of the character and whatnot, as the man with no name from this trilogy, and he references the good and the bad and the ugly. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't just say from one film, He you know, he mentioned this film as well. Oh, interesting. So, um, and when you look at Fett, who, of course, is... Arguably the coolest character, you know. I, I, I'm, I am, I like Boba Fett. I, th- I, I dig his character. I think the obsession with his character is ridiculous. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I know I'm going to piss off people by saying that. I just, I, yeah, he's cool. But there's so many other cool bounty hunters. I'm, I'm personally an IG88 man. I, li- I, li- I like that bounty hunter. Uh, but whatever. Fett, Fett wins, right? Yeah. So, um, sure. Yeah, so uh, you're like, whatever. Uh, uh, but when you look at the way Fett moves, particularly in Empire, with very deliberate, slow movements, he's always got, he's always calm and cool. Um, I like his voice. His voice, yeah, yeah. it's very, yeah, it, which is also very Eastwood if you think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it is, uh, it's always in control, and you know by the way he moves. This is not a guy you want to mess with. Yeah. You know, so, mm-hmm. and it's not because he's coming in, you know, pushing people over or whatever. You just know, like, he's packing a lot of firepower. You look at his armor. You know he's been through some stuff. Don't screw with this guy. Yeah. And um, and so that's very, very cool. And that is not the only thing we're going to talk about today. Yeah. Um, but that's the main point. Mm-hmm. Okay. I said earlier that I wasn't sure what the parts that would look the same from you know, each movie, Mm -hmm. but I was rolling around in my head the whole Boba Fett thing and the fact that I thought Boba Fett uh, matched up a lot with Lee Van Cleef's character. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, Because Lee Van Cleef ends up being the bad. Right. And he's the one that's kind of chasing after the other two. Right. And it kind of just harkened me back to him, to Boba Fett, Mm -hmm. you know, Chasing after Han, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, and I thought a lot, and we can talk about this later if you want. Mm-hmm. I thought that um, uh, Eastwood's character, the good, yes, matched up a lot with Han Solo, especially in in Empire. Yeah. So I can I can definitely see that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of tricky when well, not tricky. What's the word I'm looking for? I, I think it's people might think it's almost easy when you're doing a western. In this type of film comparison, because of the whole Star Wars is a Western in space exactly. thing. And I know I talked about this in the last episode with Steph. Yeah. Um, when we were talking about Fort Apache. Like, you know, we didn't get it as kids. We're like, you know, no, it's in space. Duh. But, no, and then you watch these films and you're like, oh, I get it. I, I, how these characters carry themselves with the, the holstered gun mm-hmm. and the extra stuff. I mean, even Blondie's poncho, that the way he wears his poncho. Mm-hmm. Like, he wears it as a straight poncho in a few scenes, but it's always, like, flipped up and off the shoulder to reveal his vest and his gun. That's how Fett has a poncho. Yeah. It's not your tradition. Like, you know, when you see a poncho, you think of, like, like Luke wears it when they're going into Docking Bay 94 in A New Hope. He's, uh-huh. It's, I'm, I'm wearing a dorky poncho. Yeah. You know, but when when Fett wears it, you're like, oh, man, look at that. Yeah. Like, he's working the poncho. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's a direct, direct nod. To the man with no name is particularly in this film. Yeah. One of the things about the Good and Bad Alien when you're watching it, it's very interesting because it's an it's an American story, right? It takes place in an American Civil War. But it's shot in Europe. Yeah. And it was very interesting to see in, in learning, oh, they shot this scene in Spain. And they shot this Yeah, they, they scene. shot, uh, I guess, half of it in Italy and half of it in Spain. Yeah. And, it, I mean, it works, you know, mm-hmm. for the most part. I believe it works. And um, Yeah, there's a certain part of both countries that resemble the American West. Right. And now, you know, as... first of all, just simply as an American movie watcher, mm-hmm. but also as someone who's, you know... who. You know, I'm in video production and mm-hmm. I've done films and everything else. It was funny 
thinking they're on the other side of the Atlantic trying to make their world look like ours mm-hmm. when we're trying so hard to make, you know, our whatever, you know, 200 plus year old country look like we have any history whatsoever. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. like yeah. I thought it was very interesting that they were engineering to us. It, it, it felt it felt weird. And and um, well, but, to be perfectly honest, we're the only country that ever had a Wild West. So if they're going to mm. make a Western, it's got to be about America. Yeah, so that's a good point. Th- they had to do it that way. Yeah, it was very cool, and I think and um, that was the thing too is that like w- like with their representation, I loved how unbelievably rugged and dirty their world was. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Clint Eastwood is he's pretty pristine. I mean, sometimes it looks like they just ironed his shirt and he's wearing it, but yeah. for the most part. He and the other characters, really, especially um, Eli Wallach's character, like is just dirty and rough. Uh-huh. And um, and the and the and the house, like the houses and, and the buildings are rough. Mm-hmm. The landscape looks rough. Yeah. Um, the train, to your point, like it just it, it's because it Billy is decapitated person. <laughs> it's yeah. You know, the trains are rough. Like everything is dirty, and um, the only thing that's o- was almost idyllic was when they when they stumble across the. Uh, the military camp by the bridge, mm-hmm. and at first it looks like they're in this peaceful grove, and it looked very European to me. It looked like, oh, I, I've been on that dirt road by you know <laughs> the, the groves, you know, and then you know, and then the camera reveals, oh, look, there's an embankment of you know 1,500 soldiers, yeah, <laughs> just off frame. That dirtiness and uh, the Kurosawa term is immaculate reality. Yeah, like Lucas loves saying that term, immaculate reality. That definitely translates to a new hope mm-hmm. to uh, Star and, and I guess partially to Empire. Empire is very clean. Yeah, I guess it's the second scene where Van Cleef goes into that house, mm-hmm. and um, uh, well, it's the very beginning, so I guess I'm not giving anything away. Yeah. But but he basically kills the family, and then mm-hmm. you know leaves, finds out about this this treasure, and leaves. Mm-hmm. That house they go into looks so much like Uncle Owen's. Oh yeah, in Star absolutely. Wars, I'm like, like the, I'm like, this like is the, Uncle Owen's house, the Adobe style. Let's, you know, let's let's go out of order and let's talk about that scene real quick. Not only does it look like Owen's house, mm-hmm. it was very white, like the walls, yeah. the ceiling, and everything, and, and that, the round windows yes, and everything. Else. And that is Bespin. Like Bespin is very clean, very white, round windows, curved archways, the whole bit. But what struck me about that scene. First and foremost, besides the Owens, I agree with you on the Owens thing. Mm-hmm. Besides that, besides the white walls and all this other stuff, is that there's a, this awesome shot of Van Cleef, and when he comes before he comes in that house, he's standing in the doorway, and it's backlit and washed out behind him, and he's all in black, so he's silhouetted and he's got his arms, you know, on the side like he's ready to draw a gun if he had to. And he just stands there, and then we see the people in the kitchen. I think it's, um, you know, I'm assuming the old man of the house and, yeah. and, and his wife, whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, they're just sitting down to eat. And there's this extreme long shot. The dinner table's in the foreground, and Van Cleef in the doorframe is pushed back. And he's in this rectangular box. And the first thing that popped in my mind was Han and Carbonite. Okay. Was like this man trapped Very in this good. rectangle, you know, and and, and and that goes a lot. And and uh, no, I'm, I'm, some people be like, oh, okay, this is a stretch, Chris. But I will say this: that's what I'm talking about when I reference the graphic design of these two pictures. Yeah. Was that they can make something quickly iconic by putting a person in a particular space or shape. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you see someone, when you see a guy in a rectangle now with his hands up. You think Han Solo, yeah. even if you don't know what Star Wars is, you're like, oh, it's a Star Wars thing. Mm-hmm. I thought it was very cool, like, because he he hangs in that door frame. Van Cleef, hang, like, he's yeah. he's standing there in that door frame for a good number of seconds, mm-hmm. and it's very intimidating, and it's very. Um, it, it reminded me a lot of Han. That's cool. Yeah, but to go on, and 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 you know, I guess this goes a little bit with the the approach to the cinematography in both films. And shooting a man riding a horse in a, in a desert plain is not is not unique to the good man, the ugly. It's a Western thing. It was certainly done in Fort Apache and a lot of the George, John Ford films. In this particular film with the good man, the ugly, they really treated the desert in yet another unique way. And I know we talked about the desert in Lawrence Arabia, and we talked about it in Fort Apache, and we're going to talk about it here. <laughs> I, I mean, it's an amazing part of the Earth's landscape that is for some reason just so amazing when it's on film. Mm-hmm. And Sergio Leone, and uh, this film was uh, cinematography. I'm going to 
butcher this pronunciation. Tonino Delicoli. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. Gesundheit. Uh, thank you. It looks amazing, and it it's definitely been borrowed. The camera moves around a lot, and you definitely get the oppressiveness of the desert. But a lot of the shots of the, of the character, especially when Tuco's on the horse when he has no control, even just um, Blondie's entrance in the film, the man with no name's entrance in the film, when I saw these yeah. huge, extra-wide panorama shots, mm-hmm. I instantly thought of the wide hoth shots of the tauntaun going across the landscape yep. and you know and and then we then we come up in on Luke Skywalker as he talks into his glove to uh, Han absolutely yeah so i was like wow this this is cool like you know and 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 Luke on that tauntaun like if if they're saying a new hope was a western space you got this dude strapped in a saddle riding a beast across this barren landscape mm-hmm. like the, this is this is as western as you can get exactly in snow Okay, we're going to pick up. We're going to talk about some characters starting with um, Shorty and his comparisons to Yoda. And then we go from there. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm excited about that because I was actually trying to compare Shorty to C-3PO when he was in parts. But... Ah, <laughs> see, I wasn't even, I, I was just set, I was just slating that as a, <laughs> as a take. But, um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but that's cool. All right, so let's, uh, so let's talk about that. I instantly thought of 3PO when he got, Blown to pieces by the stormtroopers, and and, Ch- and Chewie had to carry and him. Chewie him had to put him back together. And there's that one scene where he's being pulled along by R two D two, and it just it kind of looked like the poor little sure. cripple guy you know from, what? from the movie. I think I, you know what, I uh, I'll take that. I think that's pretty that's pretty interesting. And mm-hmm. and you know, I, I'm I'm a big C three PO fan, so whenever we can drag him in here, let's do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> drag, get, get it. See what I did there. <laughs> uh, but the before I, you know, that's awesome. And and but one thing I want to mention before I go into the comparison, the, th- the the thing with Shorty, which is awesome, is first of all he's he's this crippled guy, right? And he doesn't have his legs, and he and he has like these wooden blocks he has on his hands to help him walk. He walks with his hands, right? And he's talking to uh, Angel Eyes, and Angel Eyes is a bad dude. Okay, the film opens up with him murdering. Person after person after person. Mm-hmm. All right, you don't screw with this guy. Mm-hmm. And he's talking, literally and figuratively, down to Shorty. Um, and Shorty isn't intimidated. That's what I thought was so cool. And he did the classic, I can't remember unless you give me more money thing. Yeah. Which I, you know, I'm used to seeing that in the films of our generation, Phil. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Us too young. Yes. Film watching people. Yes. Um, no, but uh, uh, but when you so when you see it in something from '67, you're like, whoa, this is really cool. And uh, like like, I forget what Van Cleef asks him, but it's something like, hey, do you know the name of that station? And he's yeah. like, oh, I seem to forget. And he's like scratching himself with a dollar bill, and then mm-hmm. Van Cleef has to give him more money. So that was really cool. What I thought when I was watching this interaction between him and Shorty was how interesting it is. That there is this literal short person who possesses a lot of knowledge and also is a bit of a trickster. Like he's not very straightforward with giving over the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, it's for greed, which most of this, the good many are yeah. about. Let's, the film's about greed, let's face it. Mm-hmm. It reminded me of Yoda because yeah. here Yoda's a Jedi Master. He's the person that Luke's looking for. But when we're introduced to Yoda and Empire, He's introduced as this short little trickster. It almost looks like a like a little homeless person. He's yeah. in rags and he, mm-hmm. he talks in riddles and he rips Luke's thing apart, eats his food, and he doesn't give a straight answer. And it's not until Kenobi voices in that Yoda, you know, turns on the charm, so to speak. And, and yeah, and it's basically the only time that Yoda is not serious in every single film he's in. You yeah. know, he's basically this trickster, and he. He's breaking in Luke's stuff and taking his flashlight and everything else. Yeah, I mean, it's something, I mean, uh, this, I don't want to segue here. It's something that I actually wanted in the prequels and didn't get. There was a little bit of, you know, not silliness, I guess, levity. When um, Obi-Wan comes into Yoda's classroom in Episode 2, and they joke about how Obi-Wan lost the moon. Uh. You know, like, I, I guess that's what's supposed to be the direct line to Empire, but, like, Yoda's entrance in Empire is so awesome. Mm-hmm. 
And that's what this thing with Shorty reminded me of. Was like, it's it's great to see a character frustrated, and in particular with the good and the bad, the ugly. If you go to frustrate, I mean, seeing seeing Tuku, uh, Toko, whatever you however you pronounce it, seeing his character frustrated is is funny and entertaining. Seeing Angel Eyes, seeing the bad mm-hmm. frustrated was nerve wracking. Yeah, because you're like, what's this dude going to do to this poor crippled guy? Yeah, exactly. You know. So that was my that was one of the other things I th- I thought of I thought of like this you know this yeah this I guess moment. the bad shows some mercy yeah you know <laughs> I, and well I think that's I think that's something we said too about the film is that it's called the good and the bad and the ugly but there's a little bit of each attribute in the other characters exactly and that's what makes it so cool exactly and that's why I like to compare uh, Goldie it was oh Blondie excuse me <laughs> Blondie you're thinking of three PO. <laughs> Uh, yeah, go, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I like to compare Blondie Eastwood to um, to uh, Han Solo, mm-hmm. because Han is a hero, and we all love him, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he uh, he can be a prick sometimes. Right. And so is Eastwood's character. Right. And I'm watching Empire Strikes Back, and I completely forgot about this scene, but it's the scene where he's getting ready to go out to find to search for Luke. And the guy goes, um, your Tauntaun will freeze before you get to the third marker. And Han goes, and I'll see you in hell. I'm like, wow, that's, that's tough. You know? And then in, in Good and Bad and the Ugly, Eastwood is, is the good guy, but he has no problem blowing people away mm-hmm. and, and just treating Eli Wallach like crap. Oh, yeah. You know? And I mean, torturing him. Yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I, I was seeing Han and, and Blondie as t- almost the same thing. Which is cool when you think about the fact that Fett is the one that the actor and the director from, uh, you know, from Empire. Well, not director, but, Lu- you know, Lucas is the producer or whatever. Um, but it's cool that Lucas and Bullock both reference Eastwood for Fett because, of course, Fett is Han's nemesis. Mm-hmm. And it's great that there's a similarity between the two of them. You know, to that point, there's a lot of visual cues. Like we, I mentioned the gun thing earlier with Fett's gun. Eastwood has an awesome way of putting his pistol back in his holster in The Good and the Bad the Ugly. He does this like reverse twirl of the gun, mm-hmm. and it goes in his side. Mm-hmm. Um, and every character distinct has a distinctive way they handle their gun. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Tuku always has, has it like on a string. Yeah. You know, and, and Angel Eyes, uh, you know, unfortunately I'm, 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 I can't remember how he handles the gun, but like when his gun comes out, look out, you know? Yeah. So, um... Eastwood would do this cool like holster twirl, put it back, and the second I saw it, I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's Jango Fett!" In okay. Attack of the Clones, there is a one Jedi that basically threatens Dooku and Jango Fett on like and um, oh, I forget the Gen- Genosin's name. It's something the Lesser, Poggle the Lesser, I think. And and anyway, they they you know, like he's in their, he's on their balcony and he's there with the lightsaber in his face, and Fett uh, Jango Fett. Takes the gun, shoots him, knocks him off this balcony. It's a really cool shot how he falls down to the arena floor. And then he does this and puts mm-hmm. the gun right back in his holster. And it's exactly the way Eastwood does it yeah. in The Good Man and the Ugly. Exactly. And and that's really cool because, again, the man with no name is is a Fett reference. And here it's cool that they thought of that with Django. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah, so I'm noticing a pattern here. I'm noticing that you want to compare Eastwood with Boba Fett. Right. And uh, I'm compelled to uh, compare Boba Fett with Van Cleef's character. Trust me, I had the same experience you had watching this film. Like, I'm like, wait a minute, which one is mm-hmm. supposed to be Fett? Um, I think it's only natural that the good and the bad, uh, I should say, you know, the most exceptional gunfighter who is the good mm-hmm. and the most exceptional gunfighter who is the bad would have yeah. similar characteristics. So I guess what you're saying is is Van Cleef's character is pretty much Eastwood, but the bad side of him. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah. If you want to no. get into like a really deep analysis of this, yeah, I think I totally agree. You could argue this like these three men mm-hmm. are the attributes that make up one one guy, yeah. one guy of that era. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so, yeah. So, or I think at one point, all of us want to be one of these guys. Yeah. 
You know, we want to be super cool Eastwood that comes in and saves the day and outsmarts everybody. Yeah, minus being an asshole and jail yeah, time. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> and then you know, and then and then the, you know, there, there are certain days where I think all of us wish we could just be the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. and um, and and I know you know people might be like, oh, I wasn't gonna say about the ugly, but the thing about Eli, Eli, Eli Wallach's performance of this character is, in a sad way, you want him to win. Mm-hmm. You know, like you real like it's an underdog thing, and even though he's a, I mean, he betrays Blondie left and right, you know, mm-hmm. and and he's certainly looking out for himself. Eli Wallach is totally my favorite character in this movie. Yeah, oh, he he's just so awesome. is brilliant in this movie. And uh, folks, watch this movie just for Eli Wallach. If yeah, you're gonna watch this film. Yeah, you know, I you know you know my wife said something very interesting when we were watching this movie. She when we were watching it and you saw Eastwood be Eastwood. She said, like, she actually, this, I feel like I say this in every Digging Star Wars episode. Mm-hmm. I ask her to watch the movie, the classic movie that we're comparing it to. And she's a Star Wars fan, and she, you know, she likes movies and all yeah. that. I ask, do you want to watch Good and Bad and the Ugly with me? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, fine. I have to watch it. There's one TV in our house that I can watch it on. <laughs> I'm watching it. Um, and I usually wait until, you know, obviously, for a film like this, you got to wait until the kids are asleep and all yeah. that other stuff. So I put this film on, and as she's doing laundry and going about all the other stuff that she does, you know, post 10 p.m. at night, yeah. she gets sucked in. I know. So she puts down the, the laundry draws basket. You in. She gets sucked in. And she and she said, oh, my gosh, I totally get Clint Eastwood now. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah. I mm-hmm. said, he's he's the bomb. Like, yeah. look at this guy. He's super cool. Mm-hmm. I know he's, he was super sexy back then, and I, I guess he's super I sexy. I guess, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, We're um, assuming there yeah, are yeah. people. Yeah. So he is awesome and but to that point as great and as amazing a draw Eastwood is to your point Eli Wallach both had a, had us laughing and yeah. shaking our heads and and like wondering like oh my gosh I can't believe we're they're trusting this guy again uh-huh. you know but you're right it's an incredible incredible performance yeah uh, he's the ugly and he's a creep and you obviously don't want him to be your neighbor but yeah, yeah, if hey. you ask me he is so super cool too yeah, I just every time he was on the screen, I'm like, yeah, Eli's back. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. All right, well, let me let me get on some other comparisons okay. here. These are a little more general. These aren't as specific as I've been before. You know, both both films, uh, The Good Man, the Ugly, and Empire Strikes Back, deal with a journey that is a misadventure. Okay, so you know, I mean, The Good Man, the Ugly basically is a road film. If you think about it, there's a destination they got to get there, and mm-hmm. it's a buddy picture more or less between Blondie and and Ugly. Or to take uh, even to further, them. maybe a chase movie. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The absolutely. classic chase movie. Yeah, it's sort of like the Western version of it's a mad, 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 mad world. Yeah, exactly. Empire is similar in that regard. Han was ready to leave at the beginning of Empire. You know, he did the whole thing, you know, he could use a good kiss and all that other stuff. And then when the cavern had a collapse on Hoth and he says I'll get her out on the Falcon and he grabs Leia he thinks this is a simple rendezvous yeah. he thinks we're going to get on the ship I'm going to drop her off and I'm going to move on and pay off Jabba the Hutt exactly and then they go through this adventure mm-hmm. of the asteroid belt and uh, which the asteroid is film. just unbelievably yeah. fantastic still yeah oh, I mean it's great yeah. it's great stuff and then you know the whole thing with Bespin and, and all that. The same with the Good and the Bad and the Ugly They're, you know, they have a mission but it constantly gets interrupted and it usually gets interrupted by what? Being you know shelled by the the course of action of the civil war, uh-huh. so it's you know and and an empire. It's a galactic civil war. Mm-hmm. It's getting in the way of <clears throat> Han just returning her. Excuse me, Han just returning her to where she goes, and also his uh, romantic inclinations. Yes. you know, like so, like everything keeps getting interrupted in Empire. Everything keeps getting interrupted in Good and Bad and mm-hmm. Ugly, and I think that's really cool. <laughs> uh-huh. I just keep thinking about the whole rom- romantic thing. Uh, uh, when I first saw Empire Strikes Back, I, I, I was actually watching it with my mother. And her, <laughs> her favorite line is when uh, Leia goes, uh, I love you, and Han goes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, I mean, and I, I don't know if we, it, I, first of all, it's, it, it's awesome. And I, I don't know how many uh, female film professors or professionals I've heard say, like, man, when he said that, oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, and, um, I but know it's that so Han. It's so like it's I so, know. It's so Han, and that's and that's another Harrison Ford contribution. I know yeah. um, the director uh, Krishner said that the script said "I love you," like Leia said "I love you," then Han said "I love you," and both of them on set 
were like, this is terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like this, it's got to be better. Mm -hmm. And they ran and they recorded it the way it was written. They recorded other improvs. And then Harrison Ford in one of the improvs, you know, didn't spill it before. He just said the I know and they captured it. And uh, the director was like, yeah, that's the one. And, 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 and thank God. I would love to see the dailies on that, just yeah. to see what the other lines were. Yeah, because Harrison Ford was just riffing, apparently, mm, which is cool. which is really cool. Both films have torture in them, and uh, in the Good and the Bad and the Ugly, it's poor uh, Taco or that's Taco. That's true. I did. I missed that. That's yeah. True. Yeah. He gets tortured, and he obviously gives up the name of the cemetery, mm-hmm. and then they bring in Blondie and think. Clint Eastwood's going to be tortured, and he doesn't. Angel Eye strikes a deal with him. In Empire, of course, both Leia and Han, and I guess Chewie, you know, are are tortured to draw Luke Skywalker to Cloud City. So I thought that was interesting that, you know, there's there was torture, and then torture to no point. Yeah, you know, torture for torture's sake. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was interesting, and to that effect, with the deals being made, one other another um, thing that's going on a lot in these films is deals are being made. And then broke it. Exactly. You know, and and uh, that talk about favorite parts of it. I mean, Empire is just amazing. I I just said this. Yeah. To um, one of our listeners the other day, I was talking. We were getting coffee, and he's he, <laughs> um, uh, he came up to me and he said, "All right, what's up with Fett's death?" And he he went through that whole thing. Yeah. And, and I, which I will always defend to to, oh. to my dying, to my <laughs> yes. dying day. You know, uh, I. I believe I was talking to him about this. Okay. Also. <laughs> so, um, you know, I said, "Well, look." Uh, there are issues with Jedi. I am not going to deny that. Fett's death being one of them. And I argued I don't believe he died anyway. Yeah. Because there was a great Marvel comic that took, takes place after Jedi. Mm-hmm. And Fett comes out of the Sarlacc and battles Han in a very Indiana Jones truck battle thing on a Jawa sandcrawler. And uh, that episode... Was so that issue of of Marvel Comics back in the day? Mm-hmm. Now you know now those comics are owned by Dark Horse. Um, yeah, that that particular issue was so freaking great, and it was everything you wanted that end battle to be between Han and Fett. And we wouldn't, I wouldn't have that comic if it wasn't for the the lame death in Jedi. Well, getting, I, 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 they probably just did it that way just to get things moving, right? You know. Well, I mean, I well, I, I you know, these trilogies, much like you know, like the Indiana Jones trilogy, there's uh, you know, your bright adventure, sunshine adventure start. Mm-hmm. Then there's your dark middle, you know, Indiana Jones, Temple Doom, or Empire Strikes Back, or what have you, right? And then the third one tends to fall to comedy. So Jedi had the humorous uh, Han blind hitting the on-off switch in the back of the jetpack for Boba Fett to die, mm-hmm. and Ewoks and such. And then, you know, Last Crusade, you, you add Sean Connery as a, the bumbling idiot dad, you know, yeah. or, you know, I shouldn't say idiot dad, but, you know, the no-field-experience dad. Yeah, um, yeah. That's how these things tend to go. Now, with that, and the whole point of me going through this long tirade here, is that he goes to me, Jedi's your favorite? Really? Even with Empire Strikes Back, Jedi's your favorite? And I have to say this over and over again. So listen, people. The Empire Strikes, the Empire Strikes Back is the best Star Wars film out of all six films. Mm-hmm. No one can argue that. Exactly. It is the best film. The best. Mm-hmm. That said... Jedi will always be my favorite. Yes, there. As we have said this before, there's a difference between uh, how great a movie is and where it falls on your favorite list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if someone were to come in here, uh, if I, I doubt this, but if I were ever to have a guest on this blog, and they were to say to me, "Episode one is my favorite." Mm-hmm. Hey, man, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, um, but that's but that's the honest truth. Like, Empire is the best. Star Wars film mm-hmm. ever made, and um, and I'm not going to deny that. It's probably in my top 25 of all time, definitely, wow. Empire. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just, it's, it, it's, I think it's nearly perfect. Yeah. Again, music from Paul Ollers. Thanks, Paul, for everything. Let's get back into it. And this definitely goes back to the that comparison. Now, I think, Phil, this is interesting because, you know, we're finding similarities between East, I'm finding similarities between Eastwood's character and Fett, and you're finding it with um, Van Cleef. Yeah. But, uh... It's mostly a, a physical thing, though. Uh, Boba Fett, like you were saying earlier, Boba Fett's all tough and scary and blah, 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 but he's, like, short and thin. Right. right, right. And I thought Van Cleef 
is a thin guy, you know. Well, so is Eastwood in this movie. You know, mm-hmm. So is Clint Eastwood. You know, he's this true, tall, thin guy. True, true, true. Yeah. But uh, 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 Van Cleef is more of a bounty hunter type than, well, I guess Eastwood was too. But yeah. um, they're both bad guys, but they're the, the, you take away their guns and stuff, and they're not very menacing, you know? Yeah, no, agreed. The physically, like mm-hmm. their, their makeup. What's interesting is I actually found a similarity with Eli Wallach in the fact that a lot of the film with Eli Wallach stealthily following the man with no name. He's stealthily mm-hmm. following Eastwood. I mean, as a bounty hunter would do. Yeah. I thought that was very interesting. All the bounty hunters that Vader talks to at Empire are going to go after Han. There's no question. Mm-hmm. However, we we are along the ride with Fett how he is in the, in the know about Han's trick with the trash, you know, mm-hmm. when the Imperial fleet breaks up and he follows him the Vespin. I thought that was, I mean, it's, you know, this may be more of a weaker comparison, but I thought it was very interesting that both films have characters stalking other characters. Wallach's character, who is kind of the comedy relief and the clown, mm-hmm. uh, is just as stealthy and, and and as good as Eastwood and Van Cleef. Oh, that's what's awesome about uh, his character. That scene where he's in the little shop putting the guns together, oh I was gosh. like, that's awesome. That scene, again, this is the reason why you need to watch The Good, Maddie the Ugly. Mm-hmm. That scene not only is funny, and not only is well acted by both actors on you know in mm-hmm. frame, it's unnerving. I, mm-hmm. I, again, I, I'd never seen this movie from beginning to end, and I'd never seen that scene before. So, like you, you're like, oh my gosh, why would this gun shop owner give give him anything? Exactly, he's got to shoot you. What I loved about this that particular scene was not only does that guy live, but when Tuku goes in the back and shoots the targets. And then the target turns sideways, and he shoots them that way. Mm-hmm. That was pretty freaking cool. That, yeah, and, and, and he's just as skilled as Eastwood and, yeah. and Van Cleef. In my mind, or I should say in my opinion, Tuku, Eli Walk has the best line in the entire film. And that line is, when you shoot, shoot, don't talk. Exactly. How Boba Fett is that? He had some gr- a couple of really good lines in that. Yeah, movie. I mean that's uh, yeah. Abs- there's many many good lines in it, but that that line resonated with me is like, dang, that's Fett. Uh-huh. You know, that's pretty cool. All right, so while we're talking about Tuku and his connections to Fett, which I never thought I would be comparing this guy mm-hmm. to Fett. It's maybe not so much Fett as, as it is a, a Star Wars thing. There's there's the infamous scenes, not just one scene, but when Tuku goes into this town and he discovers a bath half drawn and he adds stuff to it and he takes a bath mm-hmm. and he's got his gun with him and then, you know, there's a whole all the things that transpire when mm-hmm. someone tries to come in. Prior to him discovering the bath, when he's in town, there's all the characters are in that town. Cause that's like that's like setting up the big um you know uh, yeah, showdown at the, like, the OK Corral type scenario exactly. with guys falling. Um, so they're all in town, but there's a guy in the foreground and he's unloading stuff. And you you learn when you see this guy. He was earlier. He was. I wish I could know the the character's name, and I apologize that I don't. But he's one of Angel Eye's henchmen, and he was seen in the beginning of the film. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, because um, they were they. Uh, I think they were bounty hunters trying to catch. Wallach in the beginning, yes. right? Yes, 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 yes. Because it was long. It was before we found out about the the gold or the the coins. Yes. So anyway, you see this guy, and when you see this guy, it's a it's a reveal. It's to the audience that Angel Eyes is in town. Well, the music that is being played as he unloads this, you know, these barrels out of this wagon, and it and it hints that Angel Eyes is in town is extremely similar. To the music you hear in A New Hope on the Death Star whenever you're in the hallway and Vader's about to walk through. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not the Imperial March. I want to stress that. Yeah. But it's that it's just that leering, soft music that's yeah. unnerving. And the instant I heard in this movie, you know, you know, my ears perked up. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Because like, that's like the scary, the bad guy's coming around the corner. And, it, and, and the good and the bad and the ugly, it's hinting towards... You know, Tuco may be fooling around in a tub, but Angel Eyes is in town. Like he better, he better watch out. Exactly. So I thought that was pretty cool that that same theme is carried over, and and that's something to be said because you know, in reading about the film, you know, the music's very iconic. You hear the music, you know, it's oh geez. Western music. Just watch the movie for the music. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Jeez. But he worked on you know, He worked 
with motifs. He worked with there's music for Angel Eyes, there's music for the man with no name, mm-hmm. there's music for Toku, and then there's music for the war and all stuff. Much like John Williams did with this is Leia's theme. Yep. This is Luke Skywalker's theme. This is Obi Wan Kenobi's theme. This is Darth Vader's theme. Mm-hmm. This is Yoda's theme. You know, do, and do, and do, 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 do. yeah, and that's the thing. Like those motifs, they certainly exist in A New Hope, mm-hmm. and you know, and they are there. But that theme that you just hum. <laughs> Uh, the, I hope I didn't just break copyright law. No, no. <laughs> but that theme, the, the Imperial March, was introduced in Empire Strikes Back. It was not in A New Hope. And everyone hears that music, and they know that's Darth Vader's music, regardless of whether yeah. they watch the films or not. And and so to that point with the motifs, just like Anya did in Good and Bad and the Ugly, where he established this is this music for this character, mm-hmm. Williams had already done that in A New Hope, not denying that, but it was crystallized in Empire. Yeah. These characters have themes. Listen to Darth Vader's theme. Mm-hmm. And and what's so great about, you know, the Imperial March is that that song is almost more Star Wars than the Star Wars theme song. You know, Darth Vader's theme song, his own, you know, dun, 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 that is almost more Star Wars than the actual Star Wars That's theme very song. true. You know, That's very true. Yeah. I think most anyone can recognize the Imperial March. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think anyone can recognize the good and the bad and the ugly tune, too. Even though they never saw the movie, yeah, yeah, and that's and that you know what that, um, that is what makes, not I mean, music's we all know music's powerful and it, mm-hmm. it changes the way you know we interpret things. That shows you how powerful music is, even when it's tied to a story or a film or what have you. That it has a life of its own, and I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, music always enhances certain scenes. Yeah. So, um, to your point, you should watch this movie just to hear the music. Exactly. You will not regret just watching the opening titles of this movie because that is the opening titles of the movie are so cool. And yeah, it's a little dated. I'm not going to deny that it's dated. I think that's part of the charm. Yeah. You know, and it's. Well, it's also part of the whole spaghetti western charm, too. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that cool. 1960s European, you know, grudgy kind of stuff. I regret that I didn't watch this film earlier in my life. I regret that I didn't share it with more people earlier. But you know, you know what little influence I can have via the audio blog and having people talk about it is great. No matter where you're listening, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, or I force an MP3 down your throat when I see you, or a uh, CD from my car. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I invite you not only to listen to the episode, but uh, if you have a comment, please post it on our blog website, which is diggingstarwars.blogspot.com that's diggingstarwars all one word dot blogspot.com or you can post a comment on YouTube you can we are on Facebook you can just go to Facebook type in digging star wars you can post a comment there or email me at diggingstarwars at gmail.com and that's d-i-g-g-i-n-g s-t-a-r-w-a-r-s at gmail.com Phil, first of all, and I said this at the beginning of the episode, um, I want to thank you again for for taking time to be here. Oh, no problem, man. Uh, I'm loving this. This is fantastic. A big fan of both movies. I think actually both of them are in my top 25 of all time. Oh, wow. But I like uh, how this has been turning out for you because it's definitely driving people into watching stuff, uh, which is pretty much our goal is to get people to watch movies especially older ones. Yeah. And this has been definitely a big help for a lot of people. Yeah, well, thank you. I really appreciate mm-hmm. that. And uh, thank you, Phil, for everything that you've done. No for, problem. For the blog. I really appreciate I, it. I totally approve of all this. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. See you next year. Digging Star Wars is produced by Mitch Media and has no connection to Lucasfilm Limited whatsoever. Copyrights for films, trademark characters, and related materials discussed in Digging Star Wars remain with their respective owners. For a list of references or source material, please send an email to diggingstarwars at gmail.com.